to have you back as we begin this final segment of the 20th edition of the Doha Forum. Our next segment is a newsmaker interview. The president of his country has attempted to mediate the conflict over Ukraine while facing an electoral contest with the rise of the far right, a withdrawal of troops from Mali, an overt crisis with Algeria, and ambivalent relations with the United States following a diplomatic fallout over strategic nuclear submarines. It is my pleasure now to invite to the stage France's Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian, who will be joined by CNN's Becky Anderson. Welcome to you both. Well, thank you very much indeed, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be here um, as we close out what has been a super couple of days. I think you'll all agree. I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, interviewing the French Foreign Minister. Um, an extremely important opportunity um, for all of us, I think, uh, to get a sense of uh, specifically what has been going on uh, with regard to the French involvement um, in mediation efforts um, on the uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis and where our esteemed uh, friend here believes that we will go going forward. So I think we're just going to dive in, sir, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to kick off with an on-the-ground uh, question before we back out and talk about the kind of wider picture here. I think it's important news uh, coming in that the French president uh, will be speaking with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, to discuss the terms and conditions of an exceptional humanitarian operation to evacuate civilians in Mariupol. There couldn't be any Anything more important. I think we will all agree. I know you'll have all watched the news. Mariupol has been an absolute uh, devastating disaster for the people of Ukraine. Um, and I think it's just important if you uh, can just fill us in on exactly uh, what that um, operation uh, would look like and where we are at, sir. And then we'll back out and get a wider conversation going. Floor is yours. Thank you very much for welcoming me. I, first of all, wanted to say that this is the 24th time that, as Minister of the French Republic, I've come to Qatar. This shows the strength of our relations and uh, their diversity, but also very often the convergences that we have together in the assessments and action at the international level. And before I come back to your question, Madam, I also wanted to say that I'm extremely careful about the agility and the creativity of uh, Qatar's diplomacy in this period under the authority of His Highness Emir Tamin and with the activity of my colleague, Sheikh Mohammed. I appreciated that, particularly during the Afghan crisis, where we could see for ourselves the important diplomatic efforts undertaken by the Emirates and also having had very strong collaboration to enable our own fellow citizens but also Afghan people who were threatened, allowing them to come to Europe and France in particular. So I wanted to pay tribute and uh, saying that I particularly appreciate these days the efforts made by 
cut our diplomacy vis-à-vis the, -vis the possibility of uh, signing the JCPOA agreement, and I know that you talked about it. Bien sur la table. And which is now Je truly on the table, and I know how determined you are to be able to try and find a major agreement for the region. Les efforts que and vous also vous for the efforts that you've undertaken regarding the uh, developments in the situation uh, in Chad and here in Doha, you're welcome. A, you'll host a preparatory a transition, uh, preparatory conference for the transition in uh, Jamena, and all of that is going smoothly. So I uh, welcome uh, Qatar's agility in diplomacy and action, and I uh, thank you for this deep trust between I won't dwell on what's going to happen in Mariupol, first of all, because it's not happening here, and it needs to happen in the best uh, conditions of security and discretion, and you can see that Mariupol is a second Aleppo, and I hope with collective guilt if we do not do anything, Mariupol is siege warfare, in which Russia has embarked for a month, maybe it didn't consider siege warfare, but now this is siege warfare, and Mariupol is the most striking example. Siege warfare is a horrible kind of war, because civilian populations are slaughtered, annihilated, suffering is horrible. La durée des guerres des sièges and the duration of siege wars is quite impressive. Sont des combats so euh, this is exhausting qui, fighting. Euh, and this results in unbearable tragedies and suffering, hence the necessity of making sure that there is at least one moment when civilian populations can breathe, and this is what the um, French President of the Republic is striving to do, but players on the ground need to impose a ceasefire starting with the aggressor, because there is an aggressor in all that story. There is an invading power. A which to reach its uh, own ends is taking a population hostage in Mariupol. This is truly unacceptable. I want to drill down on France's role. Um, President Macron speaks frequently with his Russian and Ukrainian counterparts. After his last call last week, he says he does not see that there is an agreement in sight for a ceasefire in Ukraine. Why, sir? What do you understand to be the reason for President Macron's uh, position there? And does President Macron, who has a relationship with President Putin, which has allowed him to um, have made the significant efforts to try and mediate a result to this, does President Macron trust President Putin at this point? This Ukrainian tragedy goes uh, a long way in history, and France was a stakeholder, as you know, in what was called the Normandy format, which was established in 2014-2015, the aim of which was to exit the crisis in the eastern part of Ukraine. France had been a stakeholder since the Minsk Accord, and I was on these negotiations myself, and we tried to make sure that the central elements of the Minsk Accord could be put in place. At some point, there was hope in December 2019, when after President Zelensky was elected, it was considered that paths were opened to result in a peaceful and political solution to the situation in Donbass. Unfortunately, this didn't happen, and it's not for lack of trying. Uh, several times President Macron asked for the Normandy format to meet even at the highest level in order to result in concrete and acceptable solutions that would guarantee Ukraine Ukraine's integrity and sovereignty. This didn't Et take place. Ensuite, il y a eu and then there uh, was what you are aware of, both 
the enlargement of the Ukrainian conflict to issues of uh, security and stability because of the decisions made by President Putin last December, asking uh, the uh, US government and NATO about rules and regulations in Europe and the uh, willpower, the willingness to talk about issues of sovereignty and uh, provided that you have the right forum and you come there without any hidden agenda and then the brutality of the 24 February situation, the uh, diplomatic uh, brutality and then military brutality. And before I answer your question about President Macron's action, what seems to me to be the most dramatic in political and diplomatic terms after uh, one month of conflict, which was truly well identified during the meetings that took place in Brussels last week, both the NATO summit, the G7 meeting, and the European Council meeting, particularly focused on the Ukrainian issue, on three different topics. President Putin had the opposite effect of what he was seeking, of what he thought he would find. First on Ukraine. He thought there was a form of fragility, probably looking at the footage from his arrival in Crimea under enthusiastic uh, cheers in 2014, and he thought that at least in the Russian-speaking part of Ukraine, the welcome would have been the same, and that he himself was uh, expected there to assert a Russian-speaking identity, a specific Russian identity in this Ukraine. Ukrainian space. Maybe even in Ukraine he thought that mere Russian presence because of alliances or complicitness, even financial complicitness, uh, that this would provide a rift in the organization of the state. And it's exactly the opposite that happened. In a way, President Putin has contributed to creating Ukraine creating a nation, solidifying it, unifying it, giving it pride, because what has been clear since the beginning of this military crisis is also this, the strength of the resistance. You heard President Zelensky, I know, at the beginning of this Doha Forum, the strength of the resistance embodied by President Zelensky, but behind him a whole people resisting and asserting its own sovereignty. Secondly, he could have thought that European democracies collectively were weak and that they were not going to succeed in having the appropriate response to this aggression and that solidarity with Ukraine would be uh, variable in its uh, reach. And so if there were sanctions that were adopted, they would have been small because Europeans would have not been able to find an agreement between them. Exactly the opposite has happened. Never before has the European Union been so determined in its response, so swift in its response, so united in its response, so strong in its proposals as well. Reaching as far as huge issues, which are the claim and the statement during the Versailles European Council, claiming that we could have the right means to ensure Europe's energy sovereignty. So total failure, even on energy, because even a short-term objective to reduce by two-thirds energy dependency by year-end and reach a full energy, organized systemic energy um, autonomy by 2027. This is the opposite of what he was looking for. And at the same time, the transatlantic alliance has now re-energized. We had questions about its future 
on se demandait si c'était pas un instrument du passé. Et elle-même s'interrogeait sur ses propres missions, parfois, en ne respectant pas les missions de fond et les délations au moment de la création de la Nouvelle Alliance, c'est-à-dire la sécurité de l'espace transatlantique est un autre chose, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi solidaire, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une alliance qui soit à la fois forte, mais aussi une
Non, je n'ai pas de commentaire à faire. I have no comments to make about this. I didn't think you would. <laughs> with that, our time is up. Um, would you, I know you started with a message uh, to our hosts here, which um, I think was an extremely important message, um, and I uh, applaud you for doing that. I applaud the words uh, from the French Foreign Minister. Um, I thank you for hosting me here, um, and um, I know uh, that the audience um, has had a terrific time over the last couple of weeks. I know that we're not quite at the end of this, but I know that this, this, this panel, this, uh, this session, this one-on-one -on -one with the Foreign Minister is very much part of the closing panel. With that, sir, a closing, a closing thought from you? Well, I think that we are at a tipping point where beyond the Ukrainian crisis, the parameters of stability and security in Europe are challenged. And beyond that, of course, risks of global destabilization. Of all the points of, uh, of all the pillars that the international community has tried to live on since the end of the Second World War, this is a crisis that affects us all in our security, and it's very good that this Doha Forum was able to table this matter uh, in a very clear and uh, peaceful situation. Well said. Way. The French Foreign Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Foreign Minister Le Drian. Thanks again, Becky Anderson, for that interview. As we move into our final panel discussions of this 20th edition of the Doha Forum, which focuses on the prospects for global cooperation in an increasingly polarized world. Judging by the current geopolitical tensions, as you just heard, the acute crisis, the tensions among major powers, I'm very tempted to suggest that the next panel has an almost impossible mission and that it could be a very short discussion, but I won't. It's a pleasure to invite to the stage the panelists, Miguel Angel Moratinos, the High Representative for the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, Mary Robinson, the Chair of the Elders, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, President of Ireland between 1990 and 1997, and someone I had the pleasure to interview at the Presidential Palace in Dublin back then, as well as Ambassador Colin vixen Kelapili, the permanent representative of Botswana to the United Nations and the president of the Economic and Social Council for 2022, Catherine Russell, the newly appointed executive director of UNICEF, and Zaid Raz Al Hussein, president of the International Peace Institute and the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Of course, moderating this session will be Robin Niblett, director of Chatham House. Welcome to you both. Or, welcome to you all. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to crack straight on. It's at the very end of this uh, Doha Forum closing panel. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to moderate it. Uh, I'm uh, Robin Niblett, the director of Chatham House. Uh, we're delighted to be one of the strategic partners with the Doha Forum. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Lina Khatib, Sanam Vakil, others who've been helping run some of the and convene some of the sessions here along with the other many institutions that are partners. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to close out over 45 minutes. And as you can see, we've got a fantastic panel um, who are going to be very disciplined in their use of time uh, so that we can get all of their viewpoints in and also have an opportunity to reach out to you. We want to try and leave 10 minutes or so to get some questions from the floor, from other participants at this important forum. So do uh, think up if you have a question or two that you would like to pose. We'd love to be able to hear them. Uh, the title of this uh, final session is Prospects for Global Cooperation in a Polarized World. So that's a pretty big phrase, um, but I think it actually captures one of the most important challenges facing the world uh, today. Um, what we've seen, uh, I noted that we are 
pretty much halfway towards the sustainable development goals set in 2015 meant to be achieved by 2030 and certainly probably five years into them there was a sense we were going in the right direction uh, heading towards achieving them um, but it's been a really difficult last few years the sense that the accelerating process of climate change was starting to undermine uh, the ability to achieve it then the hit of the covid pandemic uh, which uh, impacted many of the poorest in the world, the most, poorest inside countries, poorest between countries. Um, and then just as we were starting to maybe emerge from the pandemic, um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has compounded uh, not just obviously uh, the suffering of people in Ukraine, but beyond it as well as we've seen commodity prices rise in particular food prices rise interest rates rise uh, the world's attention on the sdgs and those parts of the world decline um, and maybe equally importantly the structure of multilateral cooperation which so many on this panel have first-hand experience of um, potentially being ripped apart and the emergence of two camps, three camps. I'll let people talk about what they see here, but whatever it is, it isn't the multilateral world that helps deliver um, that more just future for, for the world that I think everyone here is committed to. So I'm going to ask a very simple opening question uh, to each of the panelists here, and I will introduce them literally not all in one go, but as I turn to them, um, because You've got their bios on your forum packs, on your uh, iPhones or your Android phones or whatever you've got in front of you. Um, but uh, what I'm going to ask them is a first simple question, which is going to be how do you see the war in Ukraine and the West's response um, impacting prospects for international stability and uh, global development? And then we'll have a second round with them to ask what are their answers? So please don't give me your answers at the beginning. We want to understand how you see, what is your top one or two worries uh, with the kind of experience you bring. Then we'll get some answers, and then I'm going to turn to you um, to get some additional comments or questions, and we'll give a final round uh, to our great panelists. So uh, I'm going in alphabetical order of first name, because it's quickest. Um, so uh, Kathy Russell, Executive Director of UNICEF, um, uh, in the Biden White House until, gosh, a month ago, I think, yeah. Um, but somebody therefore has had a lot of experience on uh, promoting the global w women's issue agenda for the Biden administration, sorry, for the Obama administration, um, uh, and made an ambassador for that role. Kathy, what are your biggest two or three worries right now? Maybe looking from your current seat, but from your previous responsibility as well. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Robin. I think uh, my biggest worry is probably always the same, which is that every major conflict, whether it's COVID, climate, uh, or just military conflicts, they always affect the most vulnerable. That's certainly the case here in Ukraine, uh, where we see almost uh, two million children uh, affected, uh, have left the, the country um, in, affected by this conflict in very direct ways. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's always the most vulnerable, whether it's w women, children, uh, who are affected by things like this. And, uh, you know, there's no simple answer to it. Uh, you know, obviously UNICEF and the multilateral uh, agencies, countries are providing all sorts of aid, but that's not really a solution. The solution and the only answer for children is peace. And unfortunately, we don't have peace. And. Uh, until this insanity stops over there, it, it's not going to be the case that we have a world where these children can have uh, security, where they can get an education, where it can, they can get, you know, nutritious uh, meals and things like that, where they can live peacefully. And unfortunately, the big problem for us is that all the attention now is on Ukraine, as, you know, as rightfully so in a way, but there are so many other places where there are huge challenges. Afghanistan, where I was a couple of weeks ago and where you know, we're estimating that 95% of the country is, is living below the poverty line right now, and there's serious acute malnutrition going on there. And I literally saw babies who are on the verge of starvation. Um, you know, we see conflicts still going on in Syria and other places around the world. Those countries still need help, and they're not 
they're not in the public eye, Yemen, other places where we still need assistance and that that's not getting the attention that it should because of what's happening in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, you've put both the issue and you've noted a couple of other big conflicts where there's terrible deprivation right now, Afghanistan, I suppose you could add Yemen. I mean, there's a whole uh, list we could come to and they're, they're off the news, certainly uh, in Western governments. So let me turn now to Ambassador Colin Kelapile, who is the uh, permanent representative of Botswana to the UN and for 2022, uh, the president of ECOSOC, the uh, UN Economic and Social uh, Council. Um, Colin, if I could turn to you, with your, maybe either your Echo Sock hat on or uh, that perspective from Botswana, um, how do you see this conflict spilling over into the priority issues for you? No, th thank you uh, very much, Robin, for, for this opportunity. Let me start by saying Catherine's um, concern is also my concern for the very reason that UNICEF is part of the Echo Sock system. So one of our key focus area is exactly the mandate of UNICEF. But broadly, let me say that you summed up my, my real concern uh, in your own intervention. ECOSOC is the platform that is entrusted the responsibility to supervise the development agenda. The 2030 agenda and the 17 goals uh, under the oversight of ECOSOC. My main worry is therefore obviously that the conflict in Ukraine might slow us even further, given exactly what you said, that we are only eight years before the decade of action, and we had already suffered a lot of uh, uh, derailment we have been delayed significantly by COVID-19. The financing of the development agenda has already been impacted by COVID-19. As we know, even before entering the pandemic, the financing gap for the SDGs had already been very wide. So my worry is that anything in addition to that, especially the conflict in Ukraine, might relegate the development agenda to the back seat. So many vulnerable groups and countries might be left further behind. We just adopted the Doha program of action on 17th of March, which makes commitments by the international community to ensure that the least developed countries are not left further behind. So my worry beyond the larger membership of the UN, the developing countries, is that we are at the risk of leaving behind even furthest the least developed countries, the small island developing countries, and the, least, the landlocked developing countries, which are countries in special situations. So I would leave it there um, to say that both implementation and financing of the agenda is my main worry if the conflict in Ukraine distracts attention to the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Again, a very clear set of concerns and worries. You talk about financing, but you talked also about implementation and the capacity for that. Uh, Jen Infantino, um, known, I'm sure, to everyone here, especially in uh, Doha right now, um, uh, President of FIFA, uh, formerly Secretary General of UEFA, Sport has been one of those issues where cooperation always continued. Well, not always, but there have been exceptional moments in the past, and I'm wondering how you see it, especially in the lead-up uh, to this World Cup, um, uh, spilling over. And, uh, yeah, I'm not going to define your worry. You must have plenty of your own. Why don't you tell us how you see this, this, uh, this, this thing spilling over into your world? Yes, thank you very much. Of course, hello, everybody, and, and many thanks to Doha, to Qatar, to the organizer of this fantastic event here. Obviously, uh, what is happening uh, right now um, is, is, is terrible and has an impact on, on football, on, on soccer, on sports. In uh, general, sports and football in particular should be about inclusion, about uniting people, about bringing people together. 
and uh, obviously the consequences are that teams cannot play, not participate in competitions. But I think as a citizen of the world today, this is probably the least of our worries. We have to think about the people who suffer, as uh, Ms. Russell was saying as well, in other parts of the world, conflicts that exist. As president of FIFA, we are confronted with conflicts in uh, different parts of the world. And we need to try to help in all of these uh, conflicts in the best way possible. Nelson Mandela was saying that sport has the power to change the world. And uh, I think we all agree that uh, uh, Mandela was one of the persons, maybe one of the few persons, maybe together with Gandhi and some others who achieved something incredible for humanity in the last century. How did he do it? Well, with a peaceful process, with an inclusive process, not with the escalation of uh, aggression, of violence, but with trying to bring dialogue together. So I was very happy to hear Minister Le Drian uh, recently speaking about dialogue, about bringing people together. That's what sport has to do as well, because we cannot afford, I think, further divisions. We have to learn as well, probably, to live together. And maybe that, again, maybe that sport and football in particular can help. And maybe we have the chance to speak about it when we speak about the World Cup and bringing everyone, indeed, again, together. As, you, as you've um, taken the opportunity to talk about what can be positive about sport, I I'll let you think about the tough question I might ask you in the second round, which is about national teams in this current environment versus, let's call them, club teams. And, and whether that separation can take place or not. But I'll let you think about that, because I know you're in a very complex uh, 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 position. Mary Robinson, um, Chair of the Elders, former President of Ireland, former UN Commissioner for Human Rights, and importantly, maybe, for this conference, because we haven't had a chance to talk about it as much yet on the panel, almost also former Special Envoy for Climate Change in the lead-up to the Paris uh, COP21 successful uh, agreement. Mary, what's on your top list of worries? Well, as you know, Rob and I um, am passionate about climate justice, and the invasion of uh, Ukraine is going to aggravate and is already aggravating all the existing inequalities and injustices, and I want to really particularly focus on the injustices of climate change, uh, because it's not a neutral issue, it's a justice issue, and there are layers of injustice involved in it. The first is that climate change disproportionately and much earlier affects the poorest countries, poorest communities, small island states, and indigenous peoples, who happen to be the black and brown and indigenous peoples of our world. So it's also a racial injustice, and they're not responsible. It's the industrialized world um, that is responsible. Secondly, there's a gender dimension. Uh, women have different social roles, different power, sometimes different land rights, like land rights, but they have to put food on the table, they have to go further in drought for firewood or for water, etc. Thirdly, the intergenerational injustice, and thank goodness that school children and young people are calling us out for not taking the steps we need to take. And fourthly, the injustice of the different pathways to development. Uh, industrialized countries, we built our economies on fossil fuel, and we have to wean ourselves off now with just transition for the workers and communities affected. And, you know, a transition out of fossil fuel, a transition in to um, clean energy, and both must be a just transition. And the fifth is a, the injustice to nature herself. These were already a problem, and then we got COVID. And the rich world, did not share the vaccines. We had the inequitable access to vaccines. So the poorest countries had to cope with this problem without the resources, again, more affected by climate and now COVID. And now we have this invasion of Ukraine, which is driving up food prices. The, U Ukraine and Russia are the food um, baskets of the world. And this is affecting African countries in particular. Um, I'm more familiar with that continent than elsewhere, but also other um, countries that import food. And, and fuel is going up, and uh, fertilizer is harder to get. It's also going up. So, and the worst thing, Robin, the worst thing is it's distracting us from this crisis. It's distracting us. We're not talking about it. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report at the end of February should be our maximum attention at this conference. It's hardly been mentioned. No, I think you've 
captured it absolutely and um, well make a comment at the end but I'll, maybe I'll make it now I think part of the injustice as well as the barbarism of Vladimir Putin's decision to invade um, Ukraine is that it's damaging the world and not just damaging Ukraine um, and, and, and Europe and those around it as well. Um, Miguel Ángel Moratinos, um, former Spanish Foreign Minister, now Under Secretary General of the UN uh, and Special Representative for the Alliance of Civilizations. I have to say, Miguel, I joked, well, I don't know, joked, I said to you beforehand, wow, that's quite a title to carry right now. Alliance of Civilizations, and maybe you could just say a word or two. I'm not predetermining what is your biggest worry, but I'm your sure title must be uh, must be along with it because we are looking at a really divided world here. Over to you. No, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for the organizer to invite me again. I think I must be one of the few that attend the first Doha Forum 20 years ago, and how much it had changed, how Qatar had changed, how the world had changed. But unfortunately, when we have this kind of uh, panel of discussion, we don't take uh, and we don't extract the lessons of our successes or our failures. And I think it will be good to remind that uh, 20 years ago, we were concerned uh, about 9-11, was the war of terrorism, and then we were trying to introduce the Millennium Goals and the cooperation and the dialogue agenda and then the security agenda kicked us in the UN. This uh, progress in the issue that had been uh, mentioned by my predecessor. So today I have two main fears. Before we have had this meeting before the Ukraine war, I will have said that what concerned me as a UN part of the family, entity of the family, is that, uh, of course, as you say, that we need uh, to have a multilateralism. By the way, the last uh, forum in 2019, multilateralism was the main concern. We were all talking multilateralism, defend multilateralism, we have to get in, implement multilateralism. And there was some administration that was uh, proclaiming unilateralism. Well, the concept paper of today's forum doesn't talk about multilateralism, by the way. But we are talking about multilateralism. So my first fear is, if I was asked before Ukraine, that I don't like multilateralism a la carte, as the friend will say. What I mean, that we only gather to discuss climate change. I know it. We are all to save the planet. But we are only going to discuss climate change or even difficulties, uh, the pandemic with certain difficulties or maybe migration. But when peace and security are at stake, how we are going to discuss the rest of issue in the agenda. So my second fear is that now, as we have Ukraine war and challenge, we go back to security agenda again. And as my friend Colin said, SDG are going to be put aside. We are not going to have uh, this discussion. So <laughs> I refer my answer to my solution. And take, talking about my mandate, as you say, um, President Fantino mentioned, of course, and Mary Robinson said, the question of how we relate each other in this uh, one humanity concept, understanding different culture, religion, civilization, how we can promote uh, the human element in our relation should be part of the new agenda. So I stop here and then I'll give you some answer. Thank you very much, and thanks for everyone for keeping on time. Zaid, um, President of the International Peace Institute, uh, former um, uh, Human Rights uh, Commissioner also at the UN, also an elder. Um, so um, really, you have been at the heart of the UN process. Um, you're involved in the UN Peace Building Commission. You were former permanent representative uh, for Jordan to the UN. So you've seen it from a national perspective. You've seen it from the 
institution's perspective, um, but I'm wondering again, what would you put at the top of your list of worries right now? Because we're getting a slightly different perspective. It's unified, but I'm wondering where, where you would pick your top two worries. Well, th thank you, uh, Robin, for uh, setting the stage. I'm also delighted to be back here in Doha and to see so many friends. When I left the UN, I realized I needed every friend I could get. Um, well, of course, I agree with everything that has been said. The, thing, the two things I worry uh, about the most is uh, what uh, Putin's diabolical action has done to the rules and how we understand the rules, and two, what he could do to the machinery that allows us to sort problems out. So the first one is the rules. Nuremberg defined uh, the state act, of, a state act of aggression as the supreme international crime. It is the vehicle which opens the way for all the other crimes to take place all the most egregious of the atrocities. And this is what he has now committed. It is, in a, a sort of legal sense, a violation of Pacta Sunt Servanda, the sanctity of customary law, law that's been built over centuries, has been ripped apart by a permanent member of the Security Council. It's no small thing, this. It means we have to then begin to think of how we conduct our affairs in the context of this. There's this absurdity where the Russian Federation insists on the rules, the provisional rules of the Security Council uh, to be observed, and yet is prepared to violate this cardinal rule of non-acquisition of territory by force in such a deliberate manner. The second thing I worry about, and I will actually I'm not sure I should be saying this in public, but you're forcing me, um, is the sand that could be thrown into the machinery of the international system. We know, for example, at COP, all decisions are taken by consensus. If the Russian Federation disagrees, we have no COP outcome. No COP outcome. No movement on climate change. And that can be said time and again in different fora, right? So everything becomes gummed up, should they choose to go that way? And I worry about uh, the possibility of that happening. Interesting you raise that. Maybe we can come back to this in, in your solutions, because it struck me that within the COP uh, process and in COP21, it recognized maybe the limits of international machinery, and you had nationally determined contributions. So I suppose you could have continuing national uh, approaches, even with Russia not involved. But let me just park that thought. Maybe you could say something about how international law and the machinery may need to adapt to a, to a long period when we come back to it. Okay, we've got 20 minutes to go. And I do want to give an opportunity just to take two or three questions from the floor. So uh, may I ask you to have, you know, your one or two answers that, that you would be really pushing for, or are pushing for right now in your respective uh, areas to try to avoid this outcome. Kathy, what's possible from your perspective? Don't forget your microphone. Um, I don't have a satisfying answer. I think that the answer, the only answer really for children is to have peace. Um, I think short of that, what UNICEF works hard for is to try to get children educated because I think that is, uh, you know, at least a way to move children forward in their own countries to try to make sure they're educated and nourished, but really... Can, can I ask you just a follow-up to be specific? Do you think this is a moment where the NGO world, the big global foundations need to step up while the, some, of the, some of the governments are distracted? I mean, what are, are there vehicles to, to achieve what you've just said? Yes, I, I, think, I think, look, the, if you talk about education in particular, because obviously the peace issue is a government issue, and that is for in the hands of a, a crazy person at the moment. But the the uh, in education require is a huge problem. I mean, we're estimating that 70 percent of children in low-income countries are not able to read. Of uh, ten-year-olds are not able to read or understand a simple sentence. So that requires uh, the cooperation of huge numbers of people, governments, nonprofits, uh, everyone really to come together in a collective way to address that problem. But yes, we can move the needle for sure. And Colin, are there 
who can pick up the baton for the SDGs if, let's say, the United States and parts of Europe are distracted right now? Is there a community out there that can do it? Well, uh, there is a, a community out there. I think you would uh, know that uh, one of the 17 goals is partnerships, uh, goal number 17, that is intended to rally the private sector and other um, non-governmental players to also uh, fill in the gap because clearly the SDGs cannot be financed by governments alone. So there are players there. I would say that we need, as Zaid was uh, talking about, the multilateral system. We will need recommitment to the multilateral system. We will need recommitment to the pledges that have been made across many important initiatives. The climate agenda is one of those, the commitment to support countries. We know the ODA commitments to list developed countries, the 0.15% to 0.2% for LDCs. We need more engagement. I must already perhaps take this opportunity to say that the ECOSOC system and the season has started already in February and it's going to be running all the way to July, closing with the high level political forum, the HLPF, um, where we are going to hear from 45 countries that will present their voluntary national reviews on how they are doing in terms of implementing the SDGs. We also have, even before that, in April, the Financing for Development Forum, which is coming uh, from the 25th to the 28th. So I would encourage uh, both governments and the private sector to follow through these forums that are upcoming and renew their commitment so that we do not get distracted by the conflict in Ukraine. Yep. Maybe I should add one more that in acknowledging that Africa is being left behind in many areas, including the vaccines that you spoke about, we have agreed with the President of the General Assembly that we will convene a joint dedicated event on the development of Africa. So I would also want similarly to encourage all of you, all the partners, to be part of that process so we can recommit to multilateralism and the financing of all the commitments that we've made. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, turning to Jani, the way I would phrase the question is, what is the precedent that you think you need to set this year in 2022 for the World Cup? What is the right precedent? Well, I think this World Cup, which comes of course, after a pandemic and in the, in the midst of these turbulences that we are living, will be a unique occasion. A unique occasion to unite, try to unite the world. Multilateralism has been, has been mentioned. I was saying we need to again learn to live with each other by respecting each other, by respecting as well some differences which exist using the positive values that sport can have. Look at what the World Cup has, has done here in Qatar in terms of workers' rights, for example, or to stay in the region in uh, Iran, we are speaking about gender equality. Women are allowed now to go in football stadiums in Iran. This was not allowed for 40 years. It's maybe a small drop, but it's something important. Um, in Saudi Arabia, there is, there is a women's league as well, women playing football. It's important. It's little messages, but very visible messages and the World Cup for the first time in an Arab country, for the first time in the Middle East, in the Gulf, with one and a half million people coming, four billion people watching on TV, will, I think, I'm convinced and I hope, help to get rid once and for all of some of the prejudice that exists, because we have to mention this also. We are here in, in the Arab world, prejudice from the Western world, where I come from, towards the Arab world. Well, when people come here, they will see that it's a welcoming country that you can celebrate, that you can enjoy, that you can be with other people. And we need more of these occasions, like the World Cup, more events to bring men, women, and children together to help them knowing each other, because this contributes to the education, this contributes to their growth, and this hopefully can contribute to maybe a little bit of a 
of a better world. Will all those goals, those very noble goals, be undermined if the Russian national team is present? Well, the Russian national team uh, uh, today, uh, due to, to a decision taken, is not participating in the World Cup. Uh, the Russian Federation has appealed that decision. As I was saying before, I think it's much, much more important today to focus on whatever can be done for peace to happen Thank you. In, uh, in Ukraine. And then exactly. all the rest will come as a follow-up of that. Thank you very much. Mary, what's on your list? Well, as we know, it's a cliche now, we mustn't waste a crisis because it also is an opportunity. We have two very serious crises, and the first one is the invasion of Ukraine, and I agree totally with how Zaid has characterized it. It is potentially a crime of aggression. The elders have called for a tribunal and joined with others in calling for a tribunal. We know already that the International Criminal Court is looking at crimes, um, at war crimes and crimes against humanity, and even potentially um, genocide, and the ICJ has also been seized. We must not be neutral on this. Um, it is wrong if the world fragments between this being the West and Russia. It's not. Um, I have heard a number of people say they are neutral. We should not be neutral on this. I would respectfully plead with this, this region of the world don't let it become the West and Russia and fragment as to who takes sides in this. Um, this is an unacceptable invasion of a democratic country and it is something that we should all say is not acceptable in any shape or form and we, you know, not let it be a, a fragmentation of the kind that I believe that President Putin is seeking and pushing for. That's the first point. On the second crisis, because we're almost out of time and the young people and children of the world are begging us to listen to the science and understand the crisis we're in, we need a moonshot approach. You know, we put, um, you know, um, John F. Kennedy put uh, a man on the moon um, in a very, very short time. I gather most of the people working in NASA at the time were, uh, the average age was 26. You know, young talent, young people who were able to have a moonshot approach. That is what we need to shift to what is good for the world. Clean energy, rewilding, regeneration, um, smart agriculture, all of these things, and out of fossil fuel. I say this in a country and in a region um, which is, uh, you know, ha has the riches of fossil fuel. You also have the capacity to move more swiftly. And we must do this or we will have no safe world. Thank you very much. Miguel, what's your, what's your answer? Well, uh, it took uh, half a century, two world wars, to put uh, the world in order. We are uh, 22 years since we started the century. And everybody said, not only me, that after Ukraine, my clear assessment and that we cannot continue to be in the same uh, institutional framework that we have after 45. The world has changed, the issues are different, the actors are totally uh, in different uh, capacity of influence, we see how the Africans uh, demand legitimately to have a much more say in, in the UN. We know how indigenous people in America, they want to have their voice. It's not a question against West, but the West have to understand that the world have changed. And it's not the same world. And the UN have to take into account that we cannot continue as business as usual. Of course, uh, Secretary General have launched a very important common agenda. It's a good basis to start, but let's be frank. When a country is presiding over the Security Council and he has the right to veto, how? I mean, I know I'm not politically correct, I'm a part of the system, but we are uh, talking mm, clearly 
because you know the audience will say this uh, UN uh, official, they don't think, uh, they don't have any, uh, uh, no. So we have to tell the people what is going on and what are the stake. It does not how we are going to move, how we are going to reform, but the world is going to be different. Are going to live in, in between blocks again? No. And that is the alliance want to do, to bridge the difference, the disparity, the dis as uh, Infantino had said, because we are one humanity. And this one humanity has to prevail. And young generation, if we political decision makers don't make the decision, the people on the street will oblige us to make the decision. Thank you very much. Zaid, you get the last word. And I think we'll have five minutes for questions and then one last one minute each from everyone there. Please. Well, I, I believe we, we need to emphasize again that the rules are good. The rules are being violated, have been violated consistently for the last 70 years, but they're good rules, and that has to be affirmed. Uh, the second point, and here I disagree a little bit with Miguel, um, but to use the presence of Gianni Infantino with us, I think the way to look at it is in the context of football. And what we need are actually small adjustments. Small adjustments which will prevent a further recurrence of pandemics, which will address conflicts more properly, yeah, and which will also help us with climate change. And what I mean by this, we have in the context of football, a club system where power lies with the owners of the clubs. It lies with the managers, it lies with the star players, and of course, it lies with the head of FIFA and the regional uh, football associations. But when the game is played, all power is given to the referee and the lines persons. These are people who are not publicly well known. If you bump into them in the street, you wouldn't know who they are. They're paid average salaries. They ride a bus. They take the subway. But all power is given to them because without them, there is no game. There is no sport. We go back to the way football is played when you're six years old in the back of your school and everyone is fouling everyone. The international system has a referee in the form of the Secretary General of the UN. The repository, the organization is the repository of most of the conventions, most of the big regulations. It's about time that all governments give power to the referee, and the referee asserts that power to preserve the normative framework we have. Otherwise, we will have the continuation of this uh, fragmentation, and, and we are in great peril. So we need to think of football as a, a good analogy for how to uh, make adjustments in our world, and how you can have competition when you have collaboration over the rules, you can have competitions on how, on how it's played out. But we don't want competition on the rules itself. And that's the way we are now. So we need to reaffirm the rules, we play by the rules, and we have a referee that we listen to. Thank you. Jenny must be rather pleased with that analogy, a very clear one, one we can all take. Right, any questions? I'm looking for any hands going up. There's one in the middle. Sorry, one over there starting. Yep. Microphone's coming to you, and then there was a person there, yep. I think we've got time for three, probably. Yep, there's a microphone coming to you. Here it comes. Thank you very much. Uh, Introduce yourself. This is Christina Petku, a member of the coalition for the UN we need. Um, I wanted to make a small comment. Um, I think that, sorry, you're saying tight. further? Tight. Tight, tight, okay. Um, I don't think we need um, a recommitment to multilateralism or small changes. I think that what we need is actually to transform multilateralism. And um, in, in the Doha Forum report, in the background paper that was mentioned, actually this was mentioned in the way forward in what we need to do. And it was also mentioned the, that one of the opportunities that we have right now 
is the Secretary General our common agendas process. Um, and looking at the ECOSOC president, um, I'm wondering what do you see in terms of transformation in the area of economic and economic prosperity because we haven't done so well thus far in terms of the paradigms that we, we have used to date. Um, so my question is how we can bring, for instance, international financial institutions, ECOSOC, and bodies such as G20 closer to each other and enhance governance in the economic space. Thank you. Thank you. Very clear. Good question. And you've got that one, Colin. Right. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Farhan Chak uh, at Qatar University and also I have his uh, NGO in Canada, Kashmir Civitas. My question is to His Excellency Zaid Al Hassan Hussein and Her Excellency Mary Robinson. We talked a lot about consistency and continuity and about the normative framework that is under threat today. But there are reasons for that threat on this normative system, this framework, in that it's unequally applied. And I think that's one of the major issues confronting us is that what about Palestine? What about Kashmir? What about Syria? And if we can see solidarity from the world community confronting these issues, you will find the peoples in the Middle East very receptive to the problems elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. There's a, there's a lady here and there was a gentleman there. Yeah, with his hand up. And the lady there, just if you could put your hand up so they can see you. Microphone, can we get the microphone to the lady there, please? Otherwise, if the microphone is near the gentleman there. Can you put oh. your hand up, please, sir? Yeah. Okay, the microphone's coming to the lady first and then there was a gentleman there. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'll speak in Arabic if you allow to me, and then you, they can translate. I have two questions, or three questions actually. Okay, I'm oh, speaking no, no, in English. No. There's definitely only time for one question and a very quick one. We have two minutes left okay. on this panel uh, right here. This Could question you ask is one for question FIFA. in English? Very short. Okay, I'm so sorry. We are talking about that we are transferring to a new word. Uh, I'm asking about this word with Israel uh, in the Palestinian case. You consider that uh, Russia, it will not uh, be participating um, the World Cup. What about Israel? Especially we're talking that they are killed our brothers. My brothers died by the Israeli army in 2008. What about this case? This is the first question. Uh, the second question, please. Uh, what about the new uh, generation uh, while UNICEF there is no project, there is no new projects in, in Palestine in general. They made this case, uh, they made a new situation in Palestine with needs. All the time we are needing uh, UNICEF and UN uh, and the projects are, right now are so limited. So in this case what you're going to do in Gaza and Palestine in general for refugees and all people. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Question heard, right gentlemen, you, sorry you had your hand up, that person there. Can you give the microphone to the man there? That, but you keep your hand up. Yep. Keep your hand up there. Pass the camera. We're going to go two minutes over. I apologize uh, to the minister. Hello. Uh, Mohammed Hassano. I'm from Syria. Uh, actually, I, I want to ask why uh, we, don't, we didn't see the reaction in Syria over 10 years, even though the enemy uh, in Ukraine, it is the same in Syria. Thank you. Very simple question. Right. <laughs> Panel, I'm going to go in reverse order because Kathy's always had to take the first one. I think it's a little unfair. In a reverse order, you've got literally 30 seconds each. Some of the questions were a few directly. Please. Um, well, okay, I'll, I'll deal with Farhan and uh, Mohammed's question. Um, look, uh, moral consistency needs to be applied by everyone, everywhere. It's very easy to point fingers at someone else and what they're doing wrong. It's hard to do it when the person or the community or the country that's doing the wrong is your own. And it's, um, it's something that it's all countries need to strive for. And I think what you were saying, Farhan, and of course Mohammed also, is absolutely correct. We all have to be morally consistent. If we condemn the actions of the Syrian government in, uh, in Syria with respect to Halab or Idlib, or you can take the community destroyed, 
we have to do the same when it comes to Yemen. We have to do the same when it comes to Libya. We have to do the same when it comes to what the Israelis are doing in the occupied Palestinian territories. We have to be consistent, all of us. And it goes with the conflicts elsewhere. Moral consistency it will, is what gives us integrity. And when we have integrity, we have credibility. When we have credibility, we can get things done. I agree with the two comments made, and they have to be applied by the international Thank community. Thank you. Um, I'm, actually, I'm, if you don't mind, because we have literally time up, I'm going to get Mary. Um, Jenny, if you don't mind, because you made good interventions earlier on, and Miguel as well, I'm just going to do Mary, Colin, and Kathy to finish up. Please. I think I can be very brief because I want to support what, um, what Zaid has said and to say that that is the approach of the elders. Um, we condemn double standards and have condemned double standards um, and want um, that moral uh, consistency in uh, applying. Um, and at the same time, um, it's, it's not an answer to um, allowing this um, terrible invasion in the 21st century of an independent country to become somehow um, a fracturing, yeah. it's the West against, the, and, and, and we're, we're not really involved. That opens up, I think, much more problems for our world. So I would plead that I absolutely uh, take the point about there is far too much double standards. I felt that when I served as High Commissioner. I know that Zaid felt it probably even more because you're from this region. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it is true. Thank you very much. Colin, quick answer uh, to that Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Um, let, let me say I agree with the speaker's uh, observation that we need transformation of the multilateral system, not just recommitment to it. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think Miguel has, has pointed some of the imperfections that can be fixed. ECOSOC is going through that transformation, actually, as we speak. Uh, last June, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 75290 on strengthening of ECOSOC. But that alone would not be enough. We need other institutions, the Security Council. I was listening to the television this afternoon, one observation saying the UN has been rendered helpless as far as the conflict in, in, in Ukraine is concerned. But one thing that is clear, it is not the UN in general, but it is the Security Council right. that is responsible. Finally, I think you, you picked on the Secretary General's report on our common agenda. I got the impression that you must have read it, because indeed there is a proposal contained in that report on a biennial summit, which is intended to bring together ECOSOC, the Secretary General himself, the G20, and the international financial institutions. So there's already a proposal under consideration, which I hope the member states would consider favorably. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Colin. Kathy, you've got the last word. I would just respond to the questions by saying that I, I would not suggest in any way that UNICEF is a perfect organization, but we are always guided by what's best for children. We have worked in Syria and in Palestine for years. We continue to work there and we're always guided by what's best for children. And I, I would just say to close that, you know, no country that does, that pr fails to protect children will ever uh, prosper or succeed. And I would encourage everyone to always think about children uh, when you're doing your work or your, uh, your sort of thought, thinking about the future, because if we don't protect them, there really is no future. Uh, thank you very much, panelists. Look, I think what you've seen from this panel is a deep, and profound commitment to the problems and the challenges beyond the crisis in Ukraine and their spillover, an understanding that uh, what has been undertaken, the war that Russia has undertaken against Ukraine, is compounding the problems that existed before. And there's a responsibility that comes with this for all of us. Uh, but I think we heard from the questions from the floor and the passion as well that consistency and double standards really undermine the capacity for a truly global response and could create, Mary, your worry about the West versus the rest. So everyone's going to have to work very hard to avoid that from happening. Could you please give a very strong hand to the panel? Thank you very much indeed.